Okay, good afternoon. We may get some more people trickling up, but uh, welcome to Arts Place. Um, it's my, I'm Ted Lind, I, I'm a board member here at the uh, Arts Council, and so also known as Arts Place Gallery. So I'd like to, um, you know, welcome you all, but also welcome our guest artist here, Raquel Rowe. Uh, her exhibition uh, just opened downstairs in our main gallery, and I'd like to thank uh, the Canada Council for the Arts for their support. Come on in. And um, the Canada Council for the Arts supported the exhibition, as well as the, the layer of very sophisticated technology that we're using for this exhibition. Uh, and I'd also, uh, again, like to thank Struts Gallery in Sackville for helping uh, with the technology. <laughs> I'd also like to mention for a lot of the photography that was done was supported by the Ontario Arts Council for uh, Raquel. So uh, they, we are live streaming this talk. So if you miss something when you're here in person and you want to see it again, it'll be available on YouTube. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Raquel. Thank you. Everyone can. I'm. I'm speaking pretty loudly, so I'm sure everyone can hear me. If you need me to speak up at any point, just be like, we can't hear you. Uh, so thank you for coming and thank you for viewing the exhibition. I'm going to be speaking for a little bit about my creative practice and research methods within contemporary art. Uh, also, if I need to slow down at any point, that's okay too. Sometimes I speak quite quickly and I have some really lengthy presenters notes because if not I ramble. It's part of my personality. So a little bit about me. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I work in photo, video, audio, oral storytelling, installation, the whole shebang. I used to paint but haven't since the pandemic and I'm from Barbados. That's the bottom right photo for me and I've been living in Canada for the past eight years and my partner Nicholas is in the back who keeps me here. <laughs> so I've exhibited to date across Canada both in solo and group exhibitions. Uh, most recently I had a show of new work that I started making at the end of last year. Uh, it's called Salt Water Cures all and that was in Vancouver in February as well as another iteration of this exhibition which is closing at a gallery in Montreal next week and Nicholas and I were in Sackville last night at the Owens for the opening of a group show there that I was also a part of where all of the artists were making work with their parents it was Enduring, like when they gave the remarks, I tear it up, and it was, it was, <laughs> it was just, it was beautiful. Everyone, like all six artists, were making work with their mothers, and I make a lot of work with my family, as you're gonna see throughout the presentation. So I moved to Canada for school. I went to the University of Guelph, where I did a bachelor's of fine arts and history, uh, historical research plays a big role within my creative practice and I'll touch on that some more about where and then I did my MFA at the University of Waterloo and I discovered Arts Place because we used to live in the Maritimes. I worked at Mount Allison University and lived there for the year like 2021 to 2022 so it's nice to be back in the Maritimes. We love it and miss it so again thank you for having me and Oh, I have one more degree, I guess, an associate's degree that I did at home at Barbados Community College in English Lit, which also comes to play in my practice and law, which does not. <laughs> so this is kind of like broad strokes what my research is made up. I like looking at identity, food studies especially a lot right now, Caribbean history, race, gender, class, performance art, video art, like you saw downstairs, contemporary practices of other black artists, especially in Canada, and research creation as a tool for information dissemination. Uh, I'm interested in the way artists working in research creation can use their visual expertise to collaborate with a wider subset of scholars and community members in conveying timely and accessible information for 
everyone. And I think that, at least in my opinion, through video and performance art and the immediacy of those mediums, uh, it can be amongst these tools. So the chicken is just dead first. This is like an early iteration of it on my right. And another performance I did in person at Scarborough Museum in Toronto on the left called Add Sugar to Taste. Uh, very, not unlike the video downstairs that's on the left, dough dumpling body, where I'm making dumplings with my body. So again, I'll get that. So my artistic practice and research are largely influenced by lots of different aspects of Caribbean history and matrilineal family, stru uh, family structures, especially uh, diasporic communities. And of course, my upbringing in Barbados. And again, the work itself takes many, many different forms. And I think that basing my research in history often allows me to have a better understanding of con lots of different contemporary relationships and contexts between Black people and North America and specific cultural phenomenons. Uh, a lot of my current work that I'm making right now takes place in the water and exploring like the birth of the Black Atlantic and Black people both in Canada and the Caribbean and different bodies of water and spaces that people inhabit, kind of bringing it all back to the land. So that's at the end, a little more on that. So the chicken is just at first, the title of the exhibition. I don't always share with people where that title comes from, but I've been starting to a lot more lately. So it actually comes from this text. It's one of my favorite texts and it was fairly new, 20, somewhere 2018 maybe it came out, maybe 2016, don't quote me, but a relatively new text by Zili Kudrid Benta. And it essentially details the life of a first gen Jamaican girl growing up in Toronto and all of the complexities that come with this as she's discovering her evolving identity. So in the text, the main protagonist goes on a summer trip back home to Jamaica essentially for the first time and meets all of her cousins. And I'll actually, I'll pull it up. So this is the quote here from where the title of the show comes from. I'll read it out. So only two days before, I'd squeal when Rodney, who was 10 like me, had wrung a chicken's neck without warning. The jerk of his hands and the quick snap of the bone had had me fall back against the coops behind me. He turned to me after I'd silenced myself and his mouth and nose were twisted up as if he was deciding whether he was irritated with me or contemptuous or just amused. Awa, he asked, you know cook soup in Canada? Sure we do, I said, my voice mumbled. The chicken is just dead first. He didn't respond and he didn't say anything about it in front of our other cousins. <laughs> so this phrase obviously really stuck with me and it was like an early point in me of like, uh, beginning to blend two cultures and two identities that I was forming, especially being in a city, in a city setting where you go to the supermarket and that's where your produce is coming from. It's you don't see the farm or anything behind it. So it was completely abnormal for this girl to experience this uh, back home and to see the chicken being killed for the first time ever. and that complete culture shock that she experienced. Uh, I, I just found that really interesting. And later in the text, the way she begins to blend her two understandings of self is through food and on her plate, like for Canadian Thanksgiving, she will have like Jamaican rice and peas, but also turkey and mashed potatoes. So I thought that again was like, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I think it happens not just in Caribbean cultures, but lots of different cultures where you start to blend what you eat on the plate. Uh, let me circle back. So another text that I'm currently really interested is a map to the door of no return. I don't have a picture of it, but it's by Dion Bran and she essentially, it's a book of like 
fiction and poems and like a short story. But if you're not familiar with it, she essentially kind of maps out the birth of the Black Atlantic again, but in such like a poetic way that I think literature can really help aid when you're doing historical research and like paints more vivid pictures, at least within a fine art context for artwork moving forward, as opposed to like, I've also read like ledgers and like, like actual historical accounts of like, um, I was looking at the ration of plantains on like plantations in like the early 1700s and they were so dry, they were so dry until I found like a fiction based book about them and then I could digest the two together. So I think it, I think like uh, literature and fiction can sometimes make reality a little more accessible. So this is also in the exhibition, it's untitled Cotton from 2021, and it comes after the other work, Washing Rice. So my research process often starts with an action or experiment, uh, action and then causation are really common methods of working for me. I often work backwards and I consider performative action such as this one as open-ended and exploratory and I often figure out why I'm compelled to do things after having done them many times and I'm like oh like this is what this has come from like memories are unearthed and I'm like this makes a lot of sense uh <clears throat> sorry so and then often the more I repeat a performance, the stronger a past memory from like 10, 20 years ago can become. And then I'm like, OK, I fully understand this. Uh, you'll see it when I talk about washing rice, because it's something my grandmother used to do and like specific folk songs she would hum. Like I couldn't remember them for the life of me. And then one day, like I was doing this performance live and they just came to me and it was like, So this piece is also in the show downstairs. Uh, this is called Taking Down 2021. And I, so I am primarily a performance artist. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference between live performance and performance for the camera. So I consider live performance, uh, to me, it retains its capacity for radicalness in a way that video actually does not. And I think it impacts the way the work is experienced. So video is an essential component of my practice. And I think performance for the camera, such as this one, it leaves me more space to experiment without having to limit to like a predetermined understanding of what the performance can be. But at the same time, I find live performance to be less restrictive and allows for engaging with an audience in a completely different way. Uh, but then again, the work is it's ephemeral and it's it doesn't last except for the documentation. If there is some and then only those present have the privilege of witnessing it, which for better or worse is its own thing. And but when I do this work, I think of it as very like methodological and there's a clear course of action often that I know I'm gonna under take and often not at the mercy of external factors or influences and I feel like I have complete control of the narrative when I'm working in this way. So and then going back to another text I really like it's about like radical presence and performance art. So this was like part of my master's research and I do talk about these pieces, don't know where, but it comes up. So I talk about the hair pieces in a little more detail as well as the washing rice. Uh, but again, so the little bit of radical performance stuff I was doing in my master's, I was looking at black artists and emphasis on the body as material and the historical tethers that can come with this. I was thinking a lot about like black females and other people of color and the way that we and they exist in the world with certain levels of visibility and how this can impact your performance work. 
So <clears throat> part of the text that I really liked argued that black performance in the Americas can be traced back to the arrival of black people for the purpose of slave labor in the Caribbean and North America. And it argued that the ability to control one's body for survival became the very essence of the black experience. And the body was then forced into the public spotlight and given compulsory visibility. So and then I think that artists working in performance inevitably inevitably face these challenges of extending like the impact of the live art experience and all the historical tethers to create a lasting record of their work. So this one is also downstairs a uh, dumpling dough body. Ted and I had a lovely conversation about it. He was like, I've always wanted to do this. And I was like, Ted, you should do this. <laughs> 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 so the performance work that I make when I'm in Canada is typically like this. It's on a backdrop and it's usually solitary and invo involves performing a single action that I'm probably familiar with, but doing in a new way. For example, uh, I make dumplings all the time, like Bajan soup dumplings, not Jamaican fried dumplings. They're completely different things, but never in this manner. So. Realistically, I'm making soup dumplings in the kitchen and not rolling them against my body. But again, something I've always wanted to do within the back of my mind is use my own body in the food making process for my, both my partner and my family to eat. <laughs> so a lot of the solo performance works that I make are influenced by a lot of the contemporary black female artists in Canada. I mostly like Canadian references, but there's some American ones I like as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with Camille Turner's work, I would consider her like a pioneer of like black female Canadian performance art. And as well as like Michelle Pearson Clark, who has her first Sobe nomination this year, and the work of like Anique Jordan, her photo work, uh, like Busey Bailey, June Clark, and then there's um, I saw the 2022 Venice Biennale, which was incredible, and Alberto Whittle, who had did the Scottish Pavilion, is originally from Barbados and won like one of the biggest awards in the whole Biennale, and it was all like video documentary and performative work. Uh, my practice, though, is also increasingly situated between both places, so I go home quite often and make a lot of work between here and Barbados. This is just uh, imagery of a live washing rice iteration where I'm doing this in person. So it's essentially a durational performance where I'm washing an entire bag of rice. And if you're not familiar with the process, I'm literally just picking through the rice to pick out like the rocks or little grains of pebbles or anything that I've found in it. So during my research, I discovered rice was brought to the Caribbean in like the 1520s-ish and essentially quickly became a sustaining life source for the region. Uh, it's like the bedrock or the main component of many dishes throughout like the Caribbean, like English, French, Dutch, you name it, rice is going to be there. And Again, throughout this research, it brought me back to something that the matriarchs in my family had historically done. And I, when I moved to Canada, I stopped doing this. And my partner does it. He does it now. He does most of the cooking. But I stopped washing rice for a long time because we're buying better grades of rice and it's no longer needed. But I was still interested in the historical implications of doing this and the labor on the body that happens in the kitchen that isn't often dis in a lot of contemporary art uh, context as well as in early anthropology like typical female spaces and spaces in the home weren't as well researched early on but it's much better now especially like food anthropology like really takes strides and leaps and bounds of looking at home kitchens uh, so anyway the performance on my right came second after the labor of the first one. Again, thinking of like the body as material, I wanted to be buried under the thing that I was like laboring over so finely, and that's how this came about. So it's like 
10 minutes long. I think the actual performance of me laying there on the cold floor, being buried under a pile of rice where I remained probably for another 10 minutes until I could no longer bear it and emerged. <laughs> Poor Nicholas probably washed rice out of my hair for days. <clears throat> so uh, this piece is also in the exhibition. Uh, it's called Mommy, Please Do My Hair. Uh, so my mom has always done my hair ever since I can remember. And this video is probably the longest durational work in the show or one of the longest ones that I have. It's taken over several weeks, months of the summer of 2020, when I guess we were all in lockdown globally. Uh, I was at home in Barbados, and it's the longest I had been home since I'd moved to Canada. And weekly, this was something I would sit and have my mother do in the morning, in the evening, during the middle of her work day, we would sit and she would do my hair and we're just kind of watching TV, always in the same spot. It has no audio downstairs, but I do have a version of it with the audio. And I think it's really interesting that we're situated in the Caribbean and for one, one entire video, we're watching like Snow Dogs with Cuba Gooding Jr. <laughs> and growing up, I, I didn't experience snow really until I moved. So growing up, I'd always wonder, like when I was watching TV, I was like, why are people wearing long sleeves and why are they so covered up? And it wasn't until I moved that it really clicked the understanding of being cold because I'd never truly experienced that. So we're watching like lots and lots of American TV and where we're situated, we watch a lot of Spanish TV as well. Like we get a lot of stuff from Venezuela. So I actually, while it's like really loud and annoying I would think I would say at some point I actually think the audio of this is really interesting and like telling of like different global contexts anyways so uh, again so a little bit about black hair I guess so my mom doing my hair is like something that stopped when I was like 13 because I straightened my hair. So like you get your hair like chemically straightened and then it changes the texture. And then probably like three years later, the natural hair movement comes about and everybody's like going back to their natural state and returning to my natural state because I was a child prior, I had never done my own hair. So then returning home back to my mother was almost like a reintroduction of her teaching me how to care for my hair. And yeah, this is, I think, it's one of my most sentimental works, at least for me. Then this piece, I think this is my favorite piece that I have in general. Uh, this work was with my paternal grandmother and the most important research out of my practice comes out of this work and often the most important conversation. So this is making sweet bread with gran. Uh, sweet bread is, I would call it a national Bajan dish. I think it could as well be. Um, it is definitely our main dessert of choice and tea time, breakfast, anytime on island. So it's made with like, you know, flour, sugar, butter, and lots of different essences and like coconut is what makes it really special. There's like fresh grated like desiccated coconut in the middle of it. And a theorist I really like, his name's Perez Fermat. He says that sweet bread is a metaphor to define Bajan culture and uh, defining it as an ongoing identity process. He says, open to hybridity, heterogeneity, and hyphenation, while sweet bread can consist of different ingredients that when combined, come to symbolize Bajan people. And I think that's really interesting. So in the 1950s, my, this is my paternal granny, my dad's mom, they moved to the UK. They were like just after the Windrush generation and they lived there for a long time, almost 20 years before they moved back to Barbados. And it's part of the video downstairs towards the end of it. I start asking my granny questions about her time in the UK. And she tells me, you know, they got there and it was like four adults living in a house. And what she literally says is that there was one stove and there's four people. So all five people couldn't cook at the same time. And this was really annoying her. So she's like, I then cleaned out the oven and I started using the oven as the fifth burner. And then she's like, and then everyone else started using the oven. <laughs> 
But then she says, like, you know, and then I'm asking her about ingredients. And I was like, so, because sometimes I can't find things from home here unless I'm in, like, Toronto. And she says, we just found what we could and made do. And it really stuck with me when I'm having these conversations with her that she didn't take much with her to the UK, but what she took with her was her recipes. What she took with her was her recipes and her culinary traditions, and these always made her feel closer to home. And I feel like a lot of people say like the taste of home in a new place can be really comforting and familiar, and I, I think this is true across all cultures. So in an effort to preserve my family's history and kind of both like a, a video and like an oral archive of our history. I'm also trying to learn the recipes because nobody else on my dad's side of the family knows how to make a single dish that she makes. Mm. So there's only like two granddaughters, me and my sister. My sister's not learning them. So I have undertaken learning all of these dishes while I still can. And I've revisited this work a lot lately. And I haven't made sweet bread in years now. And I wonder you know, one day when she's no longer around, will I be able to make it how she makes it? Will I be able to watch this video and replicate it? And I honestly don't think so, because there's no precise measurements to anything, and it's very much a pinch here, a pinch there, which I'm also going to comment on. I'm going to show you another work, which is very much uh, word of mouth and tasting and testing till you get it just right. So, oh. so this is again towards the end of the work. So again, part of my research uh, is looking at early Caribbean history. So movement to and within the Caribbean, uh, from what I've discovered, has been an early part of life there since before colonization. And self-awareness in comparison to others has long been a part of the way that Caribbean people come to understand their identities and Caribbean cuisine, especially through food, because it's a creolized cuisine it's a mix of indigenous African and various kinds of European cuisines fused together to create this new and unique thing. And the another special part of the video that I find really interesting, I'm like, Granny, like I can't find the mallow cream in Canada. I've never seen it. Mallow cream is a thick, rich orange butter. It's you can barely see it in the background on the top left. But so we're talking about this specific kind of butter. And she says, well, she starts listing off other things that I might be able to find. And she says, oh, do they have like this Irish butter? And I go like, yeah, I've seen it. And she says, OK, if it's Irish, it'll be good. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. If it's Irish, it'll be good. <laughs> So this is actually, this is a vegetable stand uh, near where I live. It's our local vegetable stand of choice by my house. Uh, anyway, so formations of identity. That's currently where I'm at this year, what I'm looking at a lot. So how and what defines us, especially in an increasing global context where people hold multiple ethnicities and nationalities and histories of migration. And those make the bedrock of many families. Uh, so again, what defines us? So food anthropologists and other scholars have often cited food as the first markers that we can culturally identify with. So again, food often carries significant social meaning, at least in my opinion. And by consuming food, with, consuming these foods, do we or can we symbolically incorporate them into our identities? And food consumption then connects to a wide range of processes related to identity, like uh, religion, cultural preferences, nationalism. All of these things are related to and through food. Everyone has a national dish. And in the Caribbean uh, and lots of other places, food and storytelling are also frequently linked. This piece is not unlike the other one that's downstairs. This is salt fish and rice. Uh, another video work with my mother where she's making salt fish and rice for the first time. Uh, it wasn't until we moved to the Maritimes that I realized other people within the country also had an affinity for the love of salted cod. And it was so pleasantly surprising that you could get a fish cake anywhere and salted cod in the supermarket, which 
is not what you could get <laughs> where I live. And I actually, I wish that we had been on the East Coast a little longer because I started to discover so many similarities within the food because of like British colonialism from both places and that we would have like in some points similar palettes. I thought that was quite interesting. So she's making saltfish and rice here. Essentially, she calls up uh, her mum, my other granny, and gets the recipe. She kind of jots it down and she begins making this dish. 10 minutes later, she gets a phone call. My granny's like forgot an ingredient that she's giving her now, <laughs> which we all know like she didn't forget. It was, she was just like, mm, it's not gonna be as good as mine. So, but then maybe I'll give it to you. <laughs> Another 20 minutes has passed. My granny calls again, not with more ingredients, but just to check in on how the dish is going. She's like, is there enough butter? Like, it should taste like this. The texture should be like this. So again, coming back to the idea of no precise measurements, but taste, texture, and smell are the markers of whether or not a dish is coming out right. And I think this is in keeping with a much larger oral tradition in the Caribbean that stems from West African tradition is well and I hopefully try to preserve that within the videos and my practice keeping things in this type of oral tradition. I feel really iffy when I like have to write things down. I'm like <sighs> so some uh, my mom actually did study art at like the bachelor's level and she has been roped into my practice many, many times. So I owe her a great thanks for consistently uh, being willing and happy to be part of my work. While she's not a performance artist, she very much remains in character throughout all of the work, sometimes <laughs> taking over with her own ideas of how work should be, and we just <laughs> let it roll. <laughs> So this is just another quote I like from a book called Black Food. It de it's a book filled with recipes that have been submitted from people all over the world. And it's really, I wish I had a picture of the text. I do not, but I've got some other stuff to cover. So I'm gonna move on. This is another still from uh, Saltfish and Rice and another text that was very formative for me early on. It's called uh, Food, Text and Culture in the Anglophone Caribbean, as well as another one I like called Food and Identity in the Caribbean. And I'm from the Anglophone region. Uh, they only speak English in Barbados, there's nothing else. But both of these texts paint a picture of both the Anglophone Caribbean and the other text paints like a broader picture of Spanish, French, and Dutch speaking islands as well. And the like food traditions that are present there, I, I've, I've read really nice case studies on Cuban identity and food. And throughout all of it, I'm looking at other artists like Carrie Mae Weems and her Kitchen Table series, you get to see like that the kitchen is this place that has been examined and re-examined multiple times by contemporary thinkers and that food and domestic spaces are part of such a large tradition of research. So this series is actually part of the photo series down stairs, uh, if you have seen the photos. So in the Caribbean, like as a region, it is dependent on food imports. It wasn't, in fairly recent history, we've started to produce a lot more of our own products. Uh, we've always produced sugar, but at least in making sweet bread, we've started making our own like locally produced cassava flowers and sweet potato for uh, flowers and things we've historically eaten. So, where am I? so through food we mobilize. The supermarket is one of my favorite places. It is my favorite place to begin research. And I think that you can learn a lot about people and places by the supermarkets, like what they stock and what people are consuming. I think it's like always very like, oh, okay, so this might uh, lead to tell you about the history of this place, the demographic, demographics, just what people are consuming in general. I find that really 
interesting. So again, when I first moved, I couldn't find ripe plantain anywhere. I was in Guelph, Ontario, and I was like, what is happening? Like, where is the plantain? I see the bananas, but then I was like, what? It's missing. So any time I'm in the supermarket and they have super ripe plantains, I snap pictures of them and I'm like interested in like where they're being imported from because some of them often don't taste very good and I, they, they don't have any semblance of like the taste of the ones I have at home like we have a plantain tree in the backyard so I imagine our tree just growing in the yard is doing something different to the commercially farmed produce um, but I Again, I think the supermarket itself is an interesting point of research. And when I lived in Sackville, I got to see kind of firsthand on like a smaller level, like supermarkets catering to growing demographics in the area. Because I noticed that at the independent in Sackville, student, as different like groups of students came in, they would start to bring in different products. And you could request for certain products to be brought in. And I've never heard of that living in Ontario. And I was like, this is amazing. And then another colleague told me about when cilantro came to town. And I was like, that is an incredible story, like the arrival of cilantro in Sackville and how it changed a lot of the things people were eating. And I was like, that's incredible. Like, so I was like looking at it on this scale that I hope to apply to bigger things. So this is part of my untitled scenic series that's on the left downstairs. And I I'm, I'm just have a couple more things. So this depicts the east coast of Barbados. It's a, I should have had a picture of the island. It's quite small, but this is on the side that touches the Atlantic Ocean, or like the first part, uh, point of contact back in the 1400s. And as a region, the Caribbean has been monopolized for tourist consumption. And part of what I'm also looking at is, since we're no longer a primary producer of sugar and tourism runs the economy, what does this do to local populations? What position does this leave local populations in? Does it leave people for better or worse or in vulnerable states? Which again, we saw during COVID when people could no longer fly what it did to certain economies and local businesses. This is a video, but it's also kind of downstairs, so I'll just. And then there is the last little bit, my new research on the Black Atlantic, looking at relationships between black bodies and water, birth size of the Black Atlantic, and also myth and folklore surrounding the sea, which is also really interesting. Uh, like, um, it's not quite mermaid mythology. They're, the creatures are a bit different, but it's kind of along those lines. Through this research, I'm also going to be looking at contemporary relationships to swimming and uh, working with the YMCA where I live. And um, contemporary relationships to swimming in urban areas for people of color and looking at how many people use public swimming places, what keeps people out of public swimming places, and <clears throat> how many people can swim and their various relationships to the water, and if they learn to swim, and how, and when, and all of that stuff. So that is eventually going to come together. This is the work that is in the Owens. Uh, this, both of these clips are me, but that video, I'm, on the, I'm in one of them, and my mother's in the other one. So this is called a sea bath. It's a traditional Bajan ritual where you essentially take a bath in the sea. Um, it's used, um, something that's like passed down between generations, and it's usually like an older population of people who swim both every morning and the evening. Like my grandfather, he swims twice a day, every day. It's, the weather is pretty nice every day, but morning and evening, rain or sunshine in the water. So, and I think of this ritual both as like common practice, but also a common practice of like self care that's communal and widespread and pass down. So, kind of looking at all of these like specific rituals based around the water. 
and folklore surrounding the water that can often prevent people, like the sea has no back door and kind of being careful and cautious in these spaces as well that you don't have any control over. And then there is also this piece that's part of that new body, it's, it's called Bodies of Water and it kind of uses baptismal imagery to understand and contextualize some of my own mythos and fear around the sea and the idea of renewal or the rebirth of oneself through submergence and reemergence. And it's a little, and this is at the end of the video. And this is my last slide. So thank you everyone for listening. Appreciate it and I can answer any questions. is like part of the materiality of the body. I think of it as like removing the self almost because I think that I wouldn't, it wouldn't be me without my head. And I think in that context, it could be anybody. And I think it's interesting as a sculptural element as well in that way. I've seen some other similar work that involves just kind of like the burial of the head and the rest of the body is laid bare. But I also, plan to do something with a full burial, but I think it would give it a very different context. And I have one more word too, where it's like just my head buried. I think from a performance standpoint, it, it's feasible and it's action forward and it's like, it's risky, but there's less risk involved with just my head being buried often. Or it also reminds me of like the phrase, your head buried under the sand. I feel like sometimes I think about that when I'm like just buried from the head. From the inside and the outside. Sort of following on, but the most jolting image to me was where body was going in one direction and then was truncated facing the other, so you had sort of two body... Do, do you know what I'm talking about? E yeah. Oops, yes. Right... Yeah. Right yeah. here. Yeah. That was like, oh! Yeah. I have shown this video work like this, where it's both videos mirrored, mm -hmm. and yeah, I understand that. Do you have any thoughts about and what's what what were you playing with, with in that image? With having them sliced together mm -hmm. and not like Well we're having them just the slice. <laughs> yeah. I for me the slice comes down to like installation aesthetics sometimes. I think mm -hmm. performance wise, like this mirroring would be impossible to do live, but it's something you could achieve through video mm -hmm. and like through the slides. And it is jarring to see the body cut like that, but I feel like then it comes back to again, like separating my self from the work and the performance and thinking of the body as a sculpture. And that was kind of what struck me was that it suddenly became a museum torso. Yes. And very separated from yes. the living body next to it, and then there was a sort of jar of that. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. Excellent. I'm just wondering, was it intentional the sort of the different treatments of the, the head being buried in food versus getting your hair done by your mother? <laughs> kind of a <coughs> complete opposite. Sort yeah, it's one's a lot more one's a lot more delicate, and there's a lot more care in one of them than the other. <laughs> I would say, but I feel like it also is an act of care for myself personally that only my head is buried, and I'm like 
I'm usually face down. So I'm face down in this one because the rice is sharp, whereas with the cotton balls, I'm able to like be face up. Um, I, before the pandemic, at least, I was really interested in like limits you could push yourself to and limits you could push your body to. <sighs> Since COVID, not as much. <laughs> <laughs> But I think maybe one day we'd get back to this, like the limits of my extremes. But I think having like the rest of my body free is a pullback from, I know I can always escape that. I think if I was in, buried entirely under anything, it would be, it would incite panic and fear in a way that I would have to like, I wouldn't be able to do it. That made me think with your head under the rice like that, how could you breathe for yeah. 20 minutes or so? It's just, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just kind of like this. Yeah. But I've, I've done this since COVID happened and it was a lot harder and it was a lot shorter and I wasn't able to like do it for the same length of time. Yeah, Raquel, I, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm an old guy and I remember when I was young, you hardly got any food available that was from those countries that had been colonized, you know? And in fact, I think pizza was introduced as an ethnic food, you know, way, way back when I was young. And you think of ribs, and you think of jerk chicken, that they're saying, none of this stuff would have been available. So it's, it's just interesting to me, just an observation, you got me thinking about how so much of the food that we like now is food that, that came from communities or groups that we're not part of the settler culture here, you know? Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I also think it's like, it's the prevalence of like eating out and fast foods. Cause I know at home we, in the eighties, McDonald's came to the island. McDonald's lasted okay. a handful of months because <laughs> nobody was, nobody was, <laughs> nobody was buying it. And it, yeah, like, yeah. they didn't like, they didn't, they were serving burgers. People don't really, People eat predominantly chicken and fish. So it didn't really make any sense for the local population. It wasn't what they liked. Mm -hmm. But now, with people cooking less and less, which is also like why I like learning to make things to like preserve cultural traditions, because I barely cook now. Even though I want to learn how to make all the cultural dishes, I don't cook a lot. We eat out a lot, mm -hmm. which again is kind of like, you know, we're losing some of like the bedstones of our cultural traditions and our food because we're not doing it. Have you written down any of these recipes? Or do you <coughs> what no, I have I like voice notes <laughs> of a lot of them but I don't have any of them written down. I thought maybe one from my mum written down like a recipe of how to make seasoning, like jerk mm -hmm. seasoning. And I made it once for a project mm -hmm. and it it didn't even <laughs> no, I, I should, no, I'm not going to write them down, but I should better uh, safeguard all of my oral recordings. I was just curious, you mentioned that you, you did paint, you were painting at one point, and then, was it, did I hear you correctly when you said around the time of COVID? I just stopped painting. Is there a reason for that? studio space I just like I no longer had access to like my space and I was painting quite large so I just wasn't able to anymore really and haven't got back into the swing of things because I like color a lot color plays like a really big part in my entire practice like I think a lot about color and color combinations when I'm like making video work and like how it's going to look and how it's going to look together but I I'm going to start back. <laughs> I'm going to start back eventually. Like it's usually like self-portraiture and the body and it's like very like large and loose. I also move around a lot. So that doesn't help with painting. <laughs> but I love painting. I feel like painting is one of the like early art forms that you learn. And I think, you know, I think painting influences the way I go about performance work because I think about composition and I think about lighting and I think all of that comes from painting. Thank you. Okay. I won't keep anyone. Thank I you. Can't <laughs>